I would like to introduce to you Ricky Levine from the Holland Museum and James Cook will be doing our program today. And without any further ado, I'll turn this over to Ricky and let her give us a museum update and then the introduction for James Cook, our wonderful photographer. Thank you, Ricky. And thank you, Pat, for the introduction. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So I, I, um, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to talk with you. I always love meeting with the Hess members and many of you are involved in the museum and other capacities as well. And uh, I promise that my updates will be brief because I know everybody wants to get to the meat of this program, which is James Cook and his wonderful um, conversation about powwows. So without any further ado, Uh, a number of indigenous people helped us create this land acknowledgement statement, which I would like to share with you now. It is posted at the museum and available to see um, whenever you come to the museum. But I think it's an important piece, not only for the current exhibit, but for ongoing uh, programming and exhibits at the museum. The Holland area surrounds Lake Makatawa, ancestrally known to the Potawatomi, Adawa, and Peoria nations as Megatagami or Black Lake. Each nation has their own rich cultural traditions and beliefs that still survive today. We, the Holland Museum, acknowledge that this land is sacred and we commit to honoring the land and the indigenous people who have stewarded it for generations through continuing education partnerships and self-reflection. The thing that drives all of our programs are our mission and our vision. And this is, includes our programs, our exhibits, uh, everything that we do to collaborate with the community and to engage visitors when they come to our community surround our mission and vision statements. I always share this because a lot of people don't know or don't remember that there are four venues for the Holland Museum. The uh, museum itself, which is on 10th Street, which was the former post office. The Capon House, which is down on 9th Street, was owned by Isaac Capon, who was the first mayor of Holland. He was also a co-owner of the tannery that was located where the Civic Center is today, probably the wealthiest man at his, in his time. And the Settler's House is just four houses up the street. And that was built by a Irish ship carpenter by the name of Morrissey. A variety of families lived there into the mid seventies. And that house has been restored to the same period as the Capon House, which is the early 1900s. And when you come to one of the historic homes, you get admission to both. And it's a really wonderful opportunity to see the haves and the have nots of the early 1900s. Um, and I encourage people to come and explore those, those two buildings. And last but not least, the Armory, which houses our administrative offices. Our vast collection of artifacts are also stored there. It's used as a rental space for uh, a number of members in the community. We use it for our events as well. The first three buildings are owned by the city of Holland and we pay them rent and run them as museums. And the last space, the Armory is owned by the museum. So education programs are coming back in a very robust way, I'm very happy to say, and they include things like tours and in-house programs and outreach programs as well. These are just samples of some of the programs that we do, both leading them as well as participating in some other organizational programs. Spark Lab Smithsonian is a really exciting space that we opened several years ago. Uh, it is a hands-on invention space that allows children and their families to learn the process of invention. And it was closed for about 14 months because of the pandemic. And I'm happy to say it was opened again in June. And it was a game changer for us when we opened and it's, and it's reinvigorating us again now that we've been reopened. Accessibility is a big priority for the museum. We really want to make sure that the museum is accessible for everyone who wants to get engaged with the museum. And we offer that in several ways. We're exploring to do it uh, in a more robust way as well. That's one of our, 
priorities in our strategic plan. We started, um, we launched a digital collections page on our website in 2018. And that's an ongoing process. Currently we have over 12,000 items available to the public just through our website. There's no cost to do that, representing 113 categories. We have over 90,000 items in our collection. So this is a process. This is going to take a lot of time to get that completely up and enabled. But every month we chip away at it a little bit more and it allows people from all over the world to have access to our collection. We're open the second Monday of every month in the evening for free from 4 to 7 p.m. And we're grateful to the Meyer Foundation for helping fund that endeavor. And what this means is people that can't come during our daytime hours have access in the evening, but it also means those that might not be able to afford admission can come in as well. Our admission is not costly, but for some it's still prohibitive and we recognize that and we really want to make it sure, make sure that it's welcoming and inviting to everyone in the community and as well as visitors. We also have special admission programs, the Blue Star Museum, um, welcomes active service members and their families. We offer reduced admission to educators and military all, all year long. We also have a reduced admission for EBT card holders. So I do want to talk briefly about some of our upcoming programs that you might be interested in. And the first one after today's program is this evening. Um, and we're really excited about this. This is um, Tales from the Archives is a fairly new series that we started just last year. And it allows people to explore our archives and then present the research that they've come across. And we've got some three young Hope College students that are presenting on women from the 1930s and 40s of Hope College and some of their um, accomplishments that really a lot of people aren't aware of. And this is the first in-person program of its type that we're doing since the pandemic started. So super excited. Hopefully we'll remember how to do it. Um, but that's tonight at uh, in Spark Lab at the museum at 7 p.m. And uh, we invite you to come. There was a registration because we weren't sure initially if it was going to be online or not. You don't need to register. Just come to the museum and explore. And by the way, Jim's exhibit will be open for your perusal if you want to come a few minutes early. On um, our cultural lens programs is a series that we've been doing for a number of years and it also ties into our strategic uh, vision of being more inclusive and diverse. And this coming Monday is our second Monday. So open for free in the evening from four to seven. We're also offering authors night. And there'll be some local authors reading some of their excerpts from their books um, during that time period and their stories of inclusion in diverse cultures. An exhibit related program um, that's gonna be done later in March. This will be a virtual program. Um, Ashinabi Family Traditions, Elizabeth Chivas um, White Pigeon uh, will tell the story of how many of the indigenous populations are still doing some of their cultural um, traditions for the environment that tie into the environment in a really robust way. And I should say, Elizabeth is also uh, featured in Jim's exhibit at the museum. Um, there's a wonderful portrait of her as well. So um, that program you do need to sign on virtually at our website. Lots of ways to support the museum. Um, certainly be a volunteer, which I know some of you are. We're looking for lots of help in front of the, the scenes and behind the scenes as far as volunteers go. Certainly membership, attend programs, visit, invite a friend, um, and shop in the gift shop. And our gift shop has gotten much more robust and, and more interesting over the last um, couple of years. We have a, a new person that's heading that up. So I invite you to just come and shop for gifts or for yourself. Our membership levels are, are vary based on your uh, income, uh, your budget, as well as your needs, and um, really accessible for most folks. We started a, a series called Preserving Our Stories. It's a fundraising series, and it's the third one. We started doing this virtual fundraising series because of the pandemic, but we found that it's really gotten a lot of interest. And what we do is we highlight a family, a multi-generational family who has 
a business currently in Holland that has had so for a number of years. We did the Holland Peanut Store and the Dijkstra Funeral Home. And our next one, March 24th, is the Holland Bowl Mill. Now, if you don't know exactly who the Holland Bowl Mill is or the Geyer family, they were the original owners of the Wooden Shoe Company, the Wooden Shoe Factory. So they tell the story about that business as well as their current um, Holland Bowl Mill. This is a fundraiser that supports our educational programs, both in the museum as well as our outreach programs with local organizations and schools. And a ticket gets you a beautiful cherry wooden bowl from the Holland Bowl Mill, as well as some goodies from Cherry Republic. So uh, it's a really fun evening. Again, more information on our website about that. We will be doing Trivia Night again. This is an in-person event that we haven't done for a number of years for the obvious reasons, and it will be April 28th. Uh, it's a fun night of trivia, prizes, comp friendly competition, food, drinks, um, and again, it's a, it's a fundraiser for the museum, so we invite you to attend um, more information on the website. And then we are also bringing back Museum on Tap, which um, will be on June 3rd. It's a great way to taste a lot of the area breweries, ciders, and wines and engage with the community. There'll be an exhibit about brewing in Holland. There'll also be some information about the chemistry of brewing. So check that one out as well. And I don't know if you're aware of the Pear Marquette caboose that's been on the property of the Patnas Train Center now for quite some time, that is owned by the museum. And we have just finished the first phase of its restoration. It is very much in need of uh, sprucing up and it looks absolutely beautiful. We've also put some signage, so it's actually an exhibit, both in English and Spanish, it's bilingual. We did have a tree come down in one of the signs, so we're repairing that as we speak. And the next phase of this restoration is actually the inside of the caboose so that we might uh, have people look in, but also perhaps occasionally come into the space. So that's another thing that you can think about um, supporting our work on. Our current hours are Mondays, Fridays, and Saturdays from 10 to five. Also the second Monday of every month from four to seven. And the clock, which is pictured here, is from the Netherlands. This is an artifact that came from the World's Fair um, and never left because of World War II. And so it was donated to the museum and it runs the first Saturday of every month at 12 noon. And it's a lot of fun to watch that in action. So on to tonight's exhibit, today's um, current exhibit, which is Contemporary Portraits of Native Americans by Jim Cook, James Cook, I know him as Jim. Um, and that runs through the middle of this month. And um, I'm going to turn over the screen to Jim, but I, I and I, for some reason, I am not seeing my introduction to him. It did not pop on my screen. So Jim, maybe you can share a little bit more about yourself um, before you get started. But this is an incredibly beautiful exhibit. And not only do you see these incredible portraits of these um, folks that Jim has built relationships with, but you hear their story, you hear about their traditions, you hear where they're from and what they're about. And that makes this, I think, that much more of an engaging exhibit. Um, so it's beautiful to look at, but you really do get to learn some of the um, history of, of these folks that were here way before any of us were. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let Jim take over and share his. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure uh, how much of an introduction I'll do for myself other than, uh, most of my professional photographic career was in Denver working as a freelance photojournalist. Uh, there, back in the days when we actually had physical magazines, I frequently worked for Newsweek, Time, uh, a lot of the other national publications. And uh, while working for them, I got onto a, a project about Native Americans. And what I'll be showing you today is part of what grew out of that. Uh, so with no further ado, I will share my screen. He says, are we seeing it yet? No.
we'll get it. Well, we had it working earlier. Says you have started screen sharing, Jim, but it's still blank. So maybe um, try unsharing and then starting over. Okay. Worked very easily earlier, didn't it? Yeah, no problem. Well, I apologize. Okay, and then when you click on share screen, does it give you the selection to yeah. click on whatever you want to share? Yep. Okay. I'm not sure why we lost it. Susan, uh, I'm gonna ask Susan, my tech assistant to come in and um, see if she can help you troubleshoot. So we, hold on. Well, I apologize everybody for this. Uh, it says it's sharing. Yeah, we're seeing that it says it's sharing too, Jim. Frustrating. Okay, I've stopped the share. I'm restarting my end. I'm definitely not a techie, but I wonder if, if it makes sense for you to come back in, but I wouldn't do that until somebody can let you in. We got it. You got it. There it is. Got it. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, uh, I just had to relaunch my software. So, okay. Well, thank you for your patience, everyone. I apologize for that, but uh, I will do all I can to make up for it and uh, give you a good presentation. What I'd like to do today is uh, actually take you to a powwow. Uh, we'll be going to the 2015 Sweetgrass Moon Powwow, which uh, is held by the Gun Lake Tribe at their Zizak camp in Hopkins, Michigan. A uh, little bit of a preface to this all, from, 19, from 1883 to 1934, the U.S. government banned Native American religious practices, including dancing and celebrations. Uh, in the 1950s, powwows once again began gaining popularity. Today, dancers from tribes throughout the USA and Canada participate in hundreds of powwows around the country uh, all year long. Quoting from the Zizak website, Powwows are times for Native American people to meet and join together in dancing, singing, visiting, renewing old friendships, and making new ones. This is a time to renew thoughts of the old ways and to preserve our rich heritage. 
Hawas also offer a chance for our non-Native friends and families to learn, discover, and to take part in this dynamic experience. Before the, okay, now I'm not getting an image. Uh, this is not good. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, let me try relaunching one more time. Okay, and if that doesn't work, try emailing me the presentation and I'll try to share it on my end. And believe me, this has been so well drilled and practiced. Well, Jim is doing um, his reboot. I just do want to share that uh, all of the programs that the museum has done, including two from Jim um, in the recent weeks, are were virtual and they've been recorded. You can go to our website or to our YouTube page for the museum and you can see those programs, which is different than today. So it's not like you'll be seeing something that you've already seen once we get going here. but. Um, Really, they're wonderful programs that I encourage you to um, take a look at. Okay, do we have an image there now? No. The share Thank screen is off right now, Jim. The screen is off again? This, okay. this share screen is. Yep, I do have the image up anyway. Did you see it now? Yes. Okay, you should see a teepee, is that correct? Correct. Okay, good. Yep, great picture, all good. Okay, we're in business. Nothing like getting it off to a good start. Okay, you see dancers now, yes? Yes. Okay. All right, before the powwow is officially open, grass dancers take to the arena. Their movements evoke the grass trampling theory of the dance's origins as dancers seem to be stomping down the grasses to prepare the area by blessing and flattening the grass for a ceremony or dance or a battle. The, the outfit is among the more elaborate of the men's regalia with colorful fringes of yarn, ribbon, used the extension of the bodies, of the dancer's body and representative of the prairie grasses swaying in the wind. The powwow is open with a prayer and ceremonial pipe. Now in this case, I don't expect you to see an image, so we're good here. This is a part where they ask you to leave your cameras down and to not take any pictures. So in being respectful, I have no pictures of this part. This is supposed to be a funny part when a picture didn't show up, but it, <laughs> now it's not as funny. The powwow gets underway with the grand entry. During the grand entry, everyone is asked to stand as the flags are brought into the arena. The color guard is usually made up of veterans. The flags carried generally include the US flag, tribal flags, the POW flag, eagle staffs of various nations or tribes that are present. They move in a clockwise circle around the arena the flags are followed by chiefs, elders, princesses, and then dancers entering the arena by dance, style, and age. They start with the men's traditional, the men's grass dancers, the women's traditional, the jingle dress, the fancy shawl, and the tiny tot. These are some of the men's traditional entering the arena. The men's traditional is a traditional dance held over from times when war parties would return to the village, they dance out the story of the battle, or hunters would return from a hunt, and they dance out their story of tracking an enemy or prey. There's several kinds of outfits and a lot of categories for dances. 
The outfit defines the type of dance that the dancer will be participating in, and they're greatly personalized. Uh, you'll hear me refer to them as outfits and regalia. You will not hear me call them a costume. They are not considered costumes. In fact, they find this offensive because they're not masquerading as something that they're not. These are them, them being themselves. Here on the left, you see a woodland uh, or Anishinaabe outfit, uh, which is representative of tribes that are on the Great Lakes. That's the green. In the center, you see what would be pretty much a Northern Plains regalia. Uh, again, everybody has personal variations on this. As you'll see through this presentation, there are all kinds of outfits, combinations of things. I'll describe other aspects of them as we go through it. Uh, there are also Southern Plains and Southeastern outfits and others that don't powwow at all. These are the women's traditional dancers entering the arena. Most will wear or carry a shawl. Some carry a hawk or eagle feather fan or a single feather. Their outfits will be made of cloth or buckskin, decorated with ribbon work, elk's teeth, shells, they wear a lot of various jewelry like hair ties, earrings, chokers, and necklaces. I'll talk about it more later, but you'll notice the third woman there is wearing a number. Flags are brought to the center of the arena as the dancers form a circle around the entire arena. And then the grand entry is followed by a flag song. Everyone is expected to continue standing for this song, just as you would for the national anthem. You'll notice the eagle staffs. The Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act passed in 1940 prohibits pursuing, shooting, poisoning, wounding, killing, capturing, trapping, collecting, molesting, or disturbing a bald or golden eagle. It's also eagle to buy or sell, barter, or otherwise offer to purchase, transport any bald eagle, alive, dead, or any part of the nest or egg. Eligible Native Americans actually have to get a permit in order to possess eagle feathers. The law allows Native Americans to wear, use, inherit, or even give feathers to other Native Americans. However, they cannot give feathers to non-Native Americans. Uh, so for me, for, for instance, to have an eagle feather would be illegal. Uh, they get all their licensing, their permits through the National Eagle Repository, which is typically where they've received uh, eagles that have been found that died naturally or died accidentally or whatever, but uh, all eagles and feathers that are discovered are brought to the repository where they will then be distributed to eligible Native Americans as they apply with their permits. Veterans are acknowledged and revered. They're accorded the same honor and respect as the warriors of past times. They're an integral part of Native American culture, a tr tradition from times when the welfare of a village depended on the quantity and the quality of fighting men. To be a warrior was a man's purpose in life. The best death a man could have was to fall defending the tribe. This is Beth and Bob Moody. At this particular powwow, they served as the head dancers. It's a large responsibility, but it's also a high honor. They lead the other dancers in the grand entry and they're expected to be visible and active in guiding, directing, and encouraging other dancers throughout the powwow. In some traditions, dancers will not enter the arena unless the head dancers are already dancing. And it's considered improper to pass them within the arena. A couple of notes about this couple. Beth is Shawnee and Potawatomi descent. And she's holding a basket as part of her regalia. Potawatomi women made baskets and bags from black ash trees or birch and hickory bark. Baskets were for storage and to carry harvests and other items. Bob is a vice chairman of the Pokagon band. He's wearing a fur, an otter fur turban. This replaced leather headbands, which had, with, had one or two feathers standing straight up in the back. They were, were replaced around 1700s. Do we have any questions at this point? Uh, okay, I'll take that as a no. Nothing yet, Jim. Okay. Uh, this is 
Marty Wabandado. He's a full-blooded Odawa serving on the Little River Tribal Council. He's been a traditional dancer for about 30 years. He was a champion dancer, but retired from competitive dancing in 1997. He wore turkey and red-tailed hawk feathers for years, and he wanted to wear eagle feathers. But his tribe was the Grand River Band, and they were not federally recognized. If you've been paying attention to the news, they're still working on getting a federal recognition. But his family had helped form the Little River Band in the 1800s, so he was able to join that band. And as shown here, he's actually wearing some eagle feathers. He's also wearing a beaver felt hat. The eagle feather, as I mentioned, is sacred. Uh, during a powwow, if a feather falls from someone's outfit, the powwow comes to a halt and a special ceremony is performed to bless and restore the feather, sometimes not back to its original owner. It may get passed on to someone else who will be more responsible with it. Nothing is without symbolism. This is Marsha Traxler Reeves. She's in a top that's made from brain tanned deer hide fashioned so the sleeves appear as if they're wings. Her fan is a goose wing from a goose that she says was taken in a good way. The multiple bead necklace and the floral beaded head hatband are reminders of the beauty and the generosity of our mother earth. Her moccasins are Ojibwe pucker toe style and made from baby bison hide. There's Everything has symbols, the, the berries on her bag, etc. her earrings, her bag, the yellow beaded cord hanging around her neck are all symbolic in some way. Marcia grew up not being aware that she was Native American. At the time that she was growing up, her family and many others were, had been taught to be ashamed of their Native American roots and they, they hid it uh, or they just were not uh, flaunting it. But she didn't realize until she was a young adult when she found out through a DNA test that she was Native American, and now she's very busy enjoying uh, the fact and, and participating in her heritage. After contact with the Euro-Americans, cotton cloth and thick wool cloth called broadcloth became the primary material for a lot of the women's clothing. These materials were secured at trading posts and re reservation stores. Originally, the skirt consisted of a square piece of deer skin. You know, it's never too early to learn about your cultural roots. Tiny tot dancers are common at powwows. You see them all the time. Their outfits are as detailed as any other, and their attention to their moves are taken just as seriously. I mentioned before the numbers. You'll see that he here is wearing a number as well. The dancers wear numbers which identify them for the judges. Many of the dances are competitions with prizes, a lot, of, a lot of it being cash. Some dancers treat it as a profession, dancing the powwow circuit. Some dancers can earn considerable sum by winning throughout the powwow season. The things that the judges look for in dancing are the intricacy of the dancer's footwork and style the dancer's ability to keep time with the drum, the quality of the dancer's outfit, and, the dance, and how the dancer presents him or herself. The judges also look to see if a dancer drops or loses part of his or her outfit for which they would be disqualified. Another tiny tot dancer, this is actually from another powwow, but it, it was worth putting in here in a jingle dress. This was taken at the Tall Bull Park powwow in Colorado. And all Braves have rough days, but here again, you'll see a very involved outfit for a small child. This was also at the Tall Bull Park powwow in Colorado. One of the dances they hold is called the All Nations Dance. Everyone is welcome to dance in the All Nations Dance, also referred to as an intertribal dance. It's open to one and all, outfit or not, Native American or not. The result is a mix of ages, regalia, and street clothes all seen together. There are no spectators at a powwow. Everyone is considered a participant. Even if you don't do anything but lend your presence, everyone has a place in the circle of people.
You can't have a powwow if you don't have a drum. And most have a few, if not several drums. Drums can be a reference to the instrument they're playing or to the group playing one. Drums, the groups, take turns playing and singing for the dancers. They're frequently competing for prizes awarded by the judges just as much as the dancers. The drum beat is the key element in what inspires and drives the dancers' movements. The drummers are caretakers of traditional songs and composers of new contemporary songs consisting of words and stories. They may be heavy on vocables, sounds versus words, such as hey ya or several other chants. It's common to see singers pinching their throats, as you see the man in the red shirt there, in order to reach octaves they can't re otherwise obtain. Women may also trill. It's a high-pitched sound with, made with the tongue in special places in a song. Uh, with a drum, there are typically three to 10 singers per drum. The lead singer will start a song alone with a phrase or a tune. The rest of the gr group then repeats the lead. This is called second. Some drums are handed down in a family. Others are donated by, to the drum group. Some of the older drums are made of deer, elk, or horse hides. The drum beat is like a heartbeat of the people, starting slowly and then beating more quickly as the singers get further into the song. The host drum, there's always a host drum, the, the one that is more or less playing most of the time is chosen by the powwow committee. The circle is an important symbol to Native Americans. Most powwows are arranged in large circles with a dance arena at the center. There are four entrances to the dance arena representing the four directions. The first circle around the arena consists of the drums, the MC, areas for the dancers and their families, and is a place for spectators. When they're not dancing, dancers may be in this first circle watching, dressing, or resting. Some arenas have permanent stands or bleachers with shaded seating. Here, Paul Charette of Jibwa and Ottawa is dressing before dancing. Just to give you an idea, this is a picture of a powwow I took in Wounded Knee, South Dakota. It was a modest but more traditional, truly a community effort though, but no less a powwow. A couple of men I knew helped put this together over a period of a couple of days with pine limbs, branches, and logs. You notice the flags, as always, they're very proud to be American, very proud of their veterans. Part of this being a traditional powwow is that some of the locals brought food, cooked the food, and fed all comers for free. Back at Zizak, Paul Shred is now ready to dance in his men's northern traditional contemporary regalia. His outfit is designed to give an interpretation of parts of the native creation stories. The front apron, the choker, the necktie, the cuffs, beadwork were all designed and beaded by a friend from the Pokagon band. The rest of the beadwork, the sewing and the feather work is all Paul's own handiwork. Paul's a telecommunications engineer for Ericsson. Across from the bleachers, the circle consists of tents, canopies to provide shelter from the sun or any rain, and where dancers and their families can congregate. You see in the background up on the hill, they, the circle has gotten a little wider, gives them a nice perspective. <clears throat> the outermost circle is occupied by vendors, tents, and trailers. You can buy materials and elements to construct your regalia, jewelry, moccasins, baseball caps, even gauzy blouses from Pakistan. How about some native branded cosmetics, body yogurt, scented soaps? Like the dancers, the vendors do the powwow circuit too. <clears throat> You'll find a fascinating array of articles you just don't find anywhere else. How about some resin bear claws or resin eagle claws? <clears throat> a lot of dancers have the real thing. 
Those are gorgeous beads too. It's a great place if you want to buy some nice uh, beaded jewelry, you'll find an incredible selection at these powwows. Or how about a good Indian taco with a Diet Coke? Even the most dedicated dancers need to eat and drink throughout the day. This is Marcus Winchester, a member of the tribal council of the Pokagon Band. He's waiting for his order in a woodland outfit. He's got traditional pouches. They pr provide the perfect place to keep modern wallets, cell phones, and the car keys handy. I, I mentioned Marcus is wearing woodlands regalia. He told me that when he was about 12, he noticed that dancers around the Great Lake region really weren't representing the woodlands culture. So he made a conscious decision to start making outfits with more woodland designs and such. He says nowadays, it's more common to see woodland designs incorporated into people's outfits. It's nice to see. <clears throat> his, his turban is otter fur. <clears throat> and at his side, he's wearing white ermine furs. <clears throat> Excuse me. And of course, everybody has to do their selfies. This is George Martin of Jibwa uh, at the Saginaw Chippewa powwow this past summer. In Native American society, the person being honored has a giveaway ceremony. Powwows are the result of a lot of hard work done by many dedicated people who work for an, pretty much an entire year to make sure that it's successful. That's the powwow committee. To show their appreciation for the honor of serving on the committee and for the community's cooperation, the committee members will usually have a giveaway during the powwow. In this case, it's a giveaway where they've put it all out on tables and with people coming through in a prescribed order, uh, they can choose from among the items being given away. And as you can see, it's quite, quite a lot of stuff there, quite a nice array of, of gifts. But again, it's the person who is honored that is giving away things, person or the group that is honored. <clears throat> Here's George Martin. Again, I showed you a moment ago, he was in a selfie. Here he is with his wife and the gifts that they chose from the giveaway. She's wearing a birch bark hat. George was the head veteran at this particular powwow. A dancer's regalia often represents countless hours of beadwork and attaching one piece to another. It may take years to collect all the items and elements before the regalia is complete. Every outfit conforms to certain standards, yet it remains a highly individual statement. For young women, the jingle dress and the dance are popular. It's an active dance with a fast tempo and requires stamina. The dance is bouncy in order to make the jingle swing and clink in a unique sound as the dancers move to keep time with the drum. <clears throat> the jingle dance has numerous theories of how it originated, but a popular one is that it originated with the Ojibwe around 1900. Hundreds of metal cones made from lids of snuff cans dangle from the dresses. Frequently you find that they use 365 of them to represent it each day of the year. Fortunately, it doesn't require that they purchase chewing tobacco or snuff. The lids, especially the McPherson brand, have become a product unto themselves and can be bought in containers of quantity or bulk. They come in silver, gold, and a variety of sizes. You'll notice all the beadwork here too. You can imagine the hours that this individual has put into putting all those beads together on her leggings. And then there are the moccasins. And then there's also the beadwork around her neck. There are two types of Potawatomi moccasins, the stitched and the pucker toe. The stitched brings together material in a circle on the top. The pucker toe shown here is sewn up the middle and has flaps on either side. Common on the back is a flap that looks like a hoof to pay homage to the deer that sacrificed its life for the moccasin. The designs and coloring are specific to each person. Supposedly every Native American should have two pairs of moccasins. The first is everyday moccasins with plain cloth. And the second is ceremonial moccasins which have beading and other elaborate designs.
This is Debbie and Robin Hazinger of Cassopolis, Michigan, posing in traditional Potawatomi outfits. Need to read their information, it's fascinating. Debbie is a 13th century great granddaughter of Pocahontas, and therefore the 14th great granddaughter of Wakunska, chief of the Powhatans. She's also a grandniece of former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Curtis Marshall. It adds up to a bloodline of Cherokee and Powhatan, plus Irish and German. Debbie designed her outfit with roses to represent the Cherokee's Trail of Tears and shamrocks to represent her Irish heritage. The fringe was taken from animal hide dress that she made and wore for her naming ceremony many years ago. Robin is Ojibwa and is a senior designer for Borg Warner. He made his entire woodland regalia, which consists of floral oriented beadwork and a typical black background. I spent one winter beading my turban and another winter beading the top. The beads that hang in front are an old way. His outfit consists of deer toe jingles on the ankles, buffalo fur on the knees, cuffs, and the tail of his fan wild turkey spurs on his necklace and a muskrat medicine bag. The sassafras dance stick was a gift from his mother. A vine grew around it, forming a spiral. The eagle head, foot, and feathers for his bustle were also gifted. I grew up hunting, fishing, living off and with the land and nature, says Robin. I believe it is important that we teach our children this and not let modern technology take such a big hold on our children. Teach them to plant, harvest, respect, nurture, and pray more. It tends to be a little bit of a stereotype sometimes, a stereotype perception that Native Americans are stoic. But uh, while I was busy trying to get my camera ready for this portrait, they were busy goofing around and didn't realize that I had started taking pictures. But they were, they were enjoying themselves, and uh, it was fun to see. They enjoyed this photo afterwards. The benefit of going to powwows for me is that uh, it's an opportunity to meet dancers, to photograph later or at the powwow. So it's hard sometimes to drag them aside from the dancing and celebration, but I frequently do talk them into coming off with me somewhere uh, nearby so we can get an interesting photo. Here's Garth Butler, an Ojibwe or Chippewa. He's wearing an outfit consisting of a chief's red coat an antique beaver skin hat, and a hand-carved war club. Below his knees are sashes made with deer toe rattles. During the French and Indian War, uh, actually, no, I take that back. During uh, I was in the days of the Hudson Bay Company that the British gave chiefs these red coats in order to honor them and get their cooperation. So they were very prized. This is Ron Wittenberg. He serves on the tribal council of the Little River Band of Odawa Indians in Manistee. Uh, I want to read his credentials also. Ron is wearing a men's traditional regalia consisting of woodlands and Western elements. I mentioned before, sometimes the outfits are combinations of things, and this is a good example of it. The leggings, for instance, are tight without fringe, and his porcupine hair roach is cut back in, in the front in the woodland style, but the eagle feather bustle is Western. Horsehair dangles from the feather ends. He did the beadwork on his eagle dance stick with colors honoring the service of his brothers and others in Vietnam. Otherwise, everything I wear was gifted by family and friends. Ron's turtle shell depicts life's journey, walking the red road into the red and purple sunset. The colors around the perimeter and the yellow dots on the feathers of his fan represent the four directions. Yellow is the east and the start of a new day. Ron dances for those who can't dance, the elders, alcoholics, drug addicts. I'm grateful to dance for everyone, he says. This is a jingle dress. Uh, she's wearing a birch bark hat. Uh, I believe it's an eagle feather fan. I, I've not been able to determine for certain, but it appears to be by my ability to tell. And she's got a deer toe rattle in her hand. 
Uh, she was also dancing in the women's traditional. So I'm not sure uh, quite how her, her qualifications based on the outfit fit the particular dances that she was participating in. From another power, well, this is uh, Anandui dressed as a dog soldier. A Cheyenne dancer brandishes a, a beaded ceremonial club topped with buffalo horns. The full feathered headdress is frequently constructed of owl feathers tipped in white, although eagle, hawk, and osprey feathers are, are tipped in red are not uncommon. <clears throat> this was taken this, this past summer at the Saginaw Chippewa Powwow. This is Cody Ko. He was born and raised in Pittsburgh, but he wholeheartedly embraces his Lakota and Northern Ute, Ute roots. Cody dances in powwows around the country as a professional competitive dancer. His is an entirely handmade northern traditional outfit, which includes porcupine quill, deer hair, bone, eagle feathers, and talons. But again, he, he was born in the city, but through the powwows has been able to get firmly in touch with his, his heritage, his culture. This is Terry Fiddler, Cheyenne River Sioux from Eagle Butte, South Dakota. He travels the country participating in powwows as a Northern traditional dancer. Historically, face and body paint were essential components for many tribes with color and pattern having great implications. Combined with patterns, colors were used to make the warriors, chiefs, and braves look more ferocious. I can tell you that uh, just talking with Terry, that color makes him feel tougher. <laughs> uh, this is taken of Terry this past summer at Mount Pleasant, Michigan. It shows the standard and personalization of face paint in his powwow attire. When I found Claudia Spicer uh, this past summer, it was the temperature is in the 90s and humid, and she was participating in competitive dancing. Uh, she was 94 years old at the time. In 1949, she was the Oto, Missouri tribal princess. She went on to perform as a tra trapeze artist in the Ringling Brothers Circus. She worked as an extra in films directed by Cecil De B. DeMille and starring Gary Cooper. Uh, those films have since been criticized for the stereotypical portrayal of Native Americans. Uh, she was participating in the women's traditional, and I should have said a couple more things about that before. The women's traditional dance is one of grace and subtlety. In one form, it basically consists of remaining stationary and bending the knees with slight up and down movement of the body. At the same time, the feet shift subtly and the women turn slightly. Or it may involve dancing slowly around the arena. The dancer always keeps one foot on the ground while moving slowly forward or bobbing slightly with the beat of the drum. And the day that she was doing this is a slow, gentle dance. But again, in, in the middle 90s and humid, I was amazed to, to see her out there participating to the degree that she was. Do I have any questions at this point? Yes, we have um, one that says, I noted a tulip shaped image on the Potawatomi woman's outfit. Was that a common element? A, a tulip? Is that what, what you asked? Was it about a tulip? Yeah, she said she thought she saw a tulip shaped image on the Potawatomi I, woman's outfit. Okay, I wouldn't be surprised by that, uh, but it probably was a very individualized thing. And to say that any of these ornamentations are common, the materials used for them would be quite common. Uh, when it gets down to it, they're just, just like I showed you. Uh, the one with the, the four leaf clover uh, and such that everybody puts things in there that make their own individual statements. So these are highly personalized outfits. So the tulips, I, I fail to notice them, but I would, I would definitely say they're not a common element by any means. This would be something that was chosen individually as part of the outfit. Okay, I mentioned that uh, how I was were great, our great source for me to meet dancers. Uh, it pretty much started with this family portrait that I did in 1990 at Red Rocks Park, Colorado. Uh, 
over several years, I became close friends with the, this whole family and uh, had a lot to do with them. We, we were guests in each other's homes and, and spent quite a bit of time together. Uh, the mother, Carmen, and her twin sister, Camille, were born uh, in South Dakota on the Re Rosebud Reservation. Their parents had been raised being ashamed of, uh, and punished for being Native American. They weren't allowed to uh, speak their native language, but Carmen was determined uh, to not let that be the case for her children. She's very proud of being Lakota Sioux, and she wanted to make sure that they were too. Uh, like many families, they'd pack up and go on the powwow circuit in the summertime uh, and just really enjoy who they were in that regard. Uh, you can see their, their outfits are very involved, very detailed like others. They introduced me to powwows. In fact, they got me to go to my very first powwow. They were the head dancers there. And it was, it was a fascinating experience for me. I watched and learned a lot. Uh, when it came to the giveaway at the end, they were the ones, in this case, not, not a powwow committee doing the giveaway. And I was totally taken by surprise when I was called out to be one of the people receiving a gift from them. Uh, very flattered. Uh, but they were honoring me, thanking me for this portrait. Uh, Carmen even got me to work on a powwow committee one year that uh, they put me in charge of publicity. And I can, I can attest it's a lot of work. Here we have a, a grass and a traditional dancer. They're the two, two from the previous portrait. As I mentioned, the, the traditional dance is one of the oldest dances of the Indians of the Northern Plains. The outfit will consist of a coup stick, eagle feathers, furs, porcupine quills, beads, bells, and may include pieces handed down for many generations. The grass dance went from when men tuck long grasses into their belts to today's colorful outfits, which are covered from shoulder and ankle with flows of brightly colored fringe, yarn, fabric, ribbons, you name it. Another grass dancer. The hair roach is among the traditional Potawatomi headdresses. It's typically made of stiff animal hair, especially porcupine guard hair, moose hair, and deer's tail hair. You've seen roaches, in the, the headgear that they call roaches in a number of these photographs. Dancers are supposed, grass dancers in particular, are supposed to keep their heads moving to keep the feathers moving constantly is a sign of a good dancer. You'll see here that uh, at this point, this is where I had dancers that I met at powwows and I was able to work out arrangements with them to meet them somewhere else to get, to get them into natural landscapes and really work on what we felt were better images of the dancers. I tried to work with getting them into landscapes that represented something about where their people were from. Here's a family, uh, not the mother included, but here's Mike and Cheyenne Poor Bear with their father. Uh, Mike is to the left. He's in a grass dancing outfit. Cheyenne is in the middle uh, in a fancy shawl outfit. And their father, Gene, is over to the right in a traditional men's outfit. Dancing, singing, observance of other traditional values just is what really helps build strong bonds within the Native American families. I, I saw a lot of this at work. Uh, when I was growing up, I don't think I can come up with a single time that my parents and I went out dancing together. Uh, when the weekends came along, I was off on my own uh, once I was old enough, but I, I don't remember ever going dancing with my, my parents. But on the other hand, you see entire Native American families show up at the powwows weekend after weekend and participate as a family. Uh, and the they look out for each other and it's a nice thing to see, very enviable. This is a, another fancy shawl dancer, sometimes referred to as butterfly dancing. Uh, fancy dancing is a new kind of exuberant freestyle dancing and prancing. It involves a lot of twirling, pirouetting steps. Young women tend to do it because it is, does require a lot of athleticism. They wear lavish shawls with long fringe, which they show off with their fancy footwork. It's a fast, complicated dance. Their dresses, leggings, and moccasins are all elaborately beaded, as you can see here. Some accounts say that it was in the early 1900s that the shawls replaced the blankets and buffalo robes 
the young girls traditionally wore in public. Another fancy shawl dancer. Again, you'll see that all of these outfits are very individualized. All the dancers I've done have not been powwow dancers. And I thought that uh, you might enjoy seeing a few others. These are Buffalo dancers at Tezuki Pueblo in New Mexico. It took me three years to work up to getting this photograph from the first time I went to the Pueblo until I've actually got permission. I've visited many, many times trying to talk them into letting me photograph this dance. It's a sacred dance. It's very important that it be treated properly. And I had to earn their trust. So I came in and I, I did portraits of people, uh, other photographs, talked to them. I visited, like I said, several times over a period of three years till they finally trusted me enough that they took me out to, to allow me to take this photograph. Uh, it's one of those days where the clouds were moving low and fast and we'd have sunshine and then we'd have a little flurry of snow and so on. And at one point, well, a few points, sir, I'd get spots of sunshine on the hill in the background and, and just gorgeous lighting, very nice effect. Uh, and I got one shot like that that I really loved. And uh, they were looking happy and the, like they were just gl glorious in their, their dance at the moment. <clears throat> and that was the photograph that I picked out that I wanted to use. But I had agreed with the elders that I'd let them have approval of anything I picked out of this. So I took my photos back and I showed them that one. And I was so pleased. I was expecting them to like it too. And they were horrified. Uh, the problem was that they weren't supposed to be smiling in this particular dance. It's a sacred dance. It's an important dance honoring the buffalo. And the smiling was wrong. So in front of them, I destroyed the original photographs so they knew that it was never going to get used for anything else. And uh, we settled it. We agreed on this one. We went through a few of them before we found one that we, we all, I liked as a photographer and that they felt good about for their, their reasons. And uh, this is the resulting image. Uh, it's interesting, I've seen photographs taken by Edward Curtis 100 years earlier at the same Pueblo, and the outfits of that time were so different than what we ended up with here. And I mentioned just before that how these outfits have evolved. And that's what I'm hoping to document, actually, is how a lot of these evolve, because certainly in another 100 years, they're going to be different again. But uh, one of the fun little footnotes on this one is that under his buffalo fur headdress, he was actually wearing a yellow herd hat as the structure that he built it on because it fit a whole lot more comfortably than a lot of the other traditional items you might use for actually sitting on your head wearing that very heavily outfit. And as you can imagine, a lot of the outfits you've seen have a lot of weight. They're expensive, they're weighty. Sometimes I can't imagine how they manage to dance in the weather they do. I can't imagine how this girl managed to dance in the snow and cold with no shoulders or with bare shoulders. In the Northwest, I was able to find some Canalt wolf dancers that agreed to meet me out on a beach and dance there. This is, they were, they lived on the Olympic Peninsula. So this is their natural habitat, their, their tribe's nat, uh, traditional habitat. Uh, these are, again, are wolf dancers. The headgear of the guy in the background is, is all cedar. Uh, their leggings, her uh, hat, her skirt are all made out of woven cedar or strips of cedar. This is another fascinating event. I was actually out here, I was doing a, a job for the Native, Native uh, Health Agency, the National Native Health Agency for the federal government. They had me out there doing a job photographing in some of the clinics. And so while I was there, I took advantage of uh, trying to track down some dancers, find some dancers and get out to do these photos. But uh, we had a lot of fun that I, I was telling people as I was trying to locate dancers that uh, I was there working on it under a federal contract to shoot Indians. And they, they all enjoyed that one. This is an Aztec dancer. There, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, there are a lot of dances you'll see at the powwows. A lot of dances I didn't show you photographs of. There, there are hoop dancers and fancy dancers of all sorts. Uh, you'll have dancers from other parts of the country that, that do come in very different outfits. Uh, at one powwow uh, in Colorado, we had a lot of Aztec dancers, and that's what we have here. The Aztecs honored their life and tradition through their dances and songs and brilliant colors and sequins in their outfits 
headdresses and with musical instruments. You can see here, he has a, a hand drum. Each dancer designs an outfit to represent an element of their preference. His represents wisdom, knowledge, purification, and the afterlife. So if you've never been to a powwow, I would encourage you to go to one. It's a great experience. Most are free. They're open to the public. They have strict rules about no alcohol, no drugs. Uh, people do bring dogs though. They're not uncommon there. In order to find a powwow, do a search on the web. You'll find that here in Michigan, we have a lot of powwows, more than you might expect go on every year, especially in the summertime. Uh, Michigan is the home to basically three different tribes, the Potawatomi, the Chippewa, and the Ottawa, also known as the Bodawatomi, the Ojibwa, and Adawa. Uh, they're all among the Anishinaabe nations that inhabited the Great Lakes region and speak variations of the Algonquin language. Uh, they're members of the Council of Three Fires. The Potawatomi are the keepers of the fire, the Ojibwas are the keepers of tradition, and the Ottawa are the keepers of trade. But again, do a search on the web. You'll find powwows around, and I, I would really encourage you to at least get one under your belt. They're, they're a wonderful experience. You will learn a lot. You'll see a lot of things that you'll never see otherwise. And with that, miigwech, or thank you. I have um, a comment in the chat from Sue that I attended a powwow at Wounded Knee and was very impressed with the complexity of the dancers' outfits, also at the range of the ages of the participants and the variety of dances. Yeah, it's not uncommon. Like I showed, we have the tiny tots. Uh, so two or three year olds, as soon as they can walk, they're out there dancing. and. You, we all know if you've, if you've had little kids around, they, they have a rhythm, they, they pick up on, on rhythm and these little kids do it. And they're as serious as anybody in the quality of what they're doing. And then you'll find people like Claudia Spicer, 94 years out, 94 years old and out there in the heat, still dancing. Uh, and I bet you I can find plenty of others that are even older than that. That's amazing. That's all I have in the chat. So if any of you want to unmute yourselves to make a comment or ask a question, please go ahead. I'm just going to say I spent a week at Wounded Knee um, about 10 years ago doing a service project with my church, and it was really interesting. Uh, part of the time we were there really spent a lot of time in learning on um, Indian history and culture and um, the practices and um, so much that we really don't know about their culture and, and their history. And uh, it, if you have a chance to spend some time, uh, it really is helps broaden our, our backgrounds a, a lot. It, uh, so much more complex than we ever thought. I ever thought. And thanks. Yeah, I, I can certainly concur with that, uh, that I have spent almost four decades working with Native Americans. And to say that I know it all would be badly misrepresenting where I'm at. Uh, I know more than I used to, is all I can claim. Uh, there's still a lot I don't know. Uh, I'm not Native American as far as I'm able to determine. I'm very heavily English, but uh, so I, I try to learn and represent them as accurately as I can. Uh, and I, I know it, there's someone I, I need to contact who has told me that, uh, that they have some feedback for some of the things I have said, nothing serious apparently, but uh, I, I know that I can't get it all perfectly right. Edward Curtis, if you're familiar with his work a hundred years ago, is criticized for the work he did for stereotypes and so on. Uh, it's impossible to do it perfectly. And I never expect that I will be able to do that, but I do expect I can always try to. Well, one of the things that I, I could share about Jim's work is that he does it with absolute respect of the people he's photographing. And you can see that through the images. Well, I do try to contact all these folks too. Like where I, I, you, I read stories from several of the people because I run it by them if I can get contact with them again afterwards and make sure that they agree with what I'm writing about them. Uh, I, I'm a big proponent of a lot of description. I, I, 
I love I love photography. I love being a photographer, but I figure a picture has to be more than a pretty picture. If you don't know what you're looking at, so what? So to me, it's very important to make sure that I include information that you can use and understand what you're looking at better. Uh, every one of these photos I showed you, there's so much more I could tell you, but uh, we're only we only have uh, one day. <laughs> And I, I should mention too that uh, what I've shown you only a few of these are from the exhibit at the museum. That that is uh, made up of, of portraits, and I pulled a few of them here, like the family portrait and a couple of the others. But uh, there, there's a whole other set down there, so don't think that you've now seen the exhibit. And I certainly would encourage you to see the uh, coming presentation with Elizabeth White Pigeon. She's she's marvelous. She knows a lot. Uh, definitely worth listening to. I'm looking forward to her presentation. Okay. Uh, what what is known about the uh, religious practices? What we would call religious practices of Native Americans was it a broad ranging among the different tribes, or did they have gods in the sense that many cultures have gods, etc.? It, it varies all over the place from what I do know. Uh, they all have stories of, of where they came from. Uh, in New Mexico, you will find uh, that the, the Navajo feel that they came from Turtle Mountain. Uh, other, you know, other places we came from the sky. So there are all, all sorts of stories and ideas about the creation. Uh, I don't know that I can accurately represent their religions well, without uh, a little further preparation, but I do know that they're, they're different all over the place. Today, uh, you know, they're, they're like anyone else that you have some that are involved. Uh, they're, they're Catholics, Protestants, very involved in uh, the religions that the Europeans brought to America. Uh, I'm sure that you can find Muslims, all sorts of them. I mean, they're, they're as diverse as anyone else. Thank you. Um, when I was at Wounded Knee, we spent a lot of time talking about, and one of the things I really um, cared about is, is taking care of the earth. And they, they, it was supposed to be for seven generations that you didn't do anything that the seven generations from now wouldn't be able to experience. So there was a, a great reverence for nature and animals and plants and uh, uh, that was that I wasn't aware of, but they really were future oriented. That they preserved what they had and and didn't use everything up as as much as um as the Europeans and Americans have. Well, they, they believe in Mother Earth, and they're they're masters at uh, making use of available materials. Uh, they, they've done that forever, and whenever they would uh, take an animal, like I mentioned, uh, the the hoof on, hoof shape on the back of a moccasin to honor the deer. Uh, typically, they would honor whatever animal gave its life to feed them uh, or to clothe them. The original environmentalists. Anybody else? <clears throat> there I am. Okay. Oh, <laughs> awesome. Those are beautiful images, Jim. Thank you so much for sharing them. If nobody else has any other questions, I'll let Pat um, wrap us up. Okay, um, Jim, thank you so much. Um, the images that you presented to us show your sensitivity to our Native Americans, their families and their culture and their stories. and. Each of your photos told an intriguing story uh, about our Native American people. So I wanna thank you very much for sharing with us. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Ricky. And I hope everyone enjoys a wonderful afternoon and you go down to the museum and see some of the other portraits that Jim has done. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much, Jim. Thank Bye everybody, have a, have a great afternoon, you guys. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Kim. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.